Hello, my name is Mark Hankin. Uh, I'm an attorney in private practice in, uh, here, and, um, um, and I've drafted um, a number of the laws that we'll be discussing today in this webinar. Uh, you can tweet your comments or your suggestions or your questions to the hashtag UCLAMDChat. First, I'm going to discuss what I call a period of time that I call the twilight zone. And I refer to it as, it's, it's, it's the period of time between life when you're competent and death. Uh, now, historically, years ago, before the advent of modern medicine, the period of twilight zone when you're not competent between life and death, com between competent life and death, was very short, typically. If you got sick, you typically became quite frail. And when you became frail, you died pretty quickly. You got a urinary tract infection or whatever. They didn't have antibiotics, and you died pretty quickly. So the twilight zone was pretty short, and we didn't have a lot of legal tools to deal with management of your affairs in the twilight zone, not that you're necessarily having any affairs, pardon the levity. Um, so um, uh, now I like to refer to this period as the twilight zone, and I'll use that term a, a bit today, because during that period of time, when you're typically when you're aged, demented, um, um, you're not able to manage your affairs well. You can't see what's happening. You can't see what's coming at you, um, and you can't think clearly about what needs to be done. So it's kind of like twilight. You can't see. That's why I like to use that term. I, or at least that's how I think of things. Now, the twilight zone, um, here's a little picture, a little a, a diagram of how I like to look at a competence. Uh, competence, you start as a child, of course. Then at age 18, you can drive. At age 21, you can drink. Uh, then competence is a, a flat, constant, linear function until at some point you become ill. Uh, when you become ill, if you have a heart attack or stroke, boom, you die and there's a very short uh, period of twilight zone. But if you get a, con uh, you, that, this can happen, you can get a stroke or a concussion and, um, and, and then you can be living for a very long period of time in the twilight zone. You can be living for decades in the twilight zone. I have a young man, a conservatorship of a young man who um, in high school, he got a concussion, and he has a normal life expectancy, and he's going to be living in the twilight zone. Um, now, Karen Quinlan is, a, is a, uh, an extreme example of uh, someone who uh, entered the twilight zone young. She entered the twilight zone when she was 21. She consumed some alcohol and diazepam, I think, val I think that's Valium and maybe some other medication, and at the age of 21, she went into a persistent vegetative state. Um, her parents asked the hospital to cut off the life support and, uh, because basically she was dead anyway, brain dead, and they wanted her to, to, die, to go in peace uh, instead of being kept alive forever. But the hospital refused, and, they were in, and the result was a lot of litigation um, and a lot of suffering by the family and, um, and uh, made newspaper headlines, and as a result of that, some legislation happened. Another example of this, which some of you may remember, is the Terry Schiavo case, where uh, a wife, a young wife, uh, had, I think it was, had a stroke, went into a, a persistent vegetative state or a coma and wanted to, the life support terminated. The parents wanted her kept alive, and the husband thought that she wanted to be let go to die in peace, and a lot of litigation happened um, because of that. So the, the law um, has responded to this with something called durable powers of attorney. Um, and you can, do, you can download these documents. You can get better documents from a lawyer, but you can download these documents yourself. Uh, uh, the durable power of attorney for financial matters allows your agent to manage your finances. Um, your agent... Um, um, yeah. Um, your agent can make um, gifts of your assets, can make retirement elections, uh, can um, sign tax returns, uh, can amend trusts or fund trusts or create trusts, 
do lots of different things depending upon what powers you give your agent in your durable power of attorney. Uh, now, um, and your agent uses his or her discretion in using these powers in your best interest. The agent has to act in your best interest. Um, the document is called a durable power of attorney because it remains effective even after you lose capacity. So it's durable. You, previously, doctor powers of attorney did not become effective, uh, di didn't stop being effective once you lost capacity. Now, um, you may think, I don't need these documents, um, but, but uh, because I have somebody who I trust and they trust me and I'm going to let them handle my affairs and my wife and I, it, everything's just fine um, and I'll always trust them. But the problem is sometimes when you get a stroke or Alzheimer's or some type of severe dementia, what you find is a total personality change and the person now loves the gardener and hates the wife and, um, and you don't know what's going to happen to you. You may have a very, you may not have a dementia. You may just be luck, one of those lucky people who gets a stroke or heart attack and out like a light. But now with modern medicine being able to keep us alive physically longer than we can keep the brain intact, we find that um, most people, I think, will have a period of dementia before they die. So a durable power of attorney is a really useful device because when I can't manage my affairs, when I'm, I can't see clearly what's happening, I can't make rational decisions, my wife, as my, health, as my durable power agent, can make financial decisions for me. She can sell the house if she needs to without going to court. The next document is called an advanced health care directive. It's also, well, it used to be called a durable power of attorney for health care. And so I'll refer to these two documents together as durable powers even though the, the, the second one is now called an advanced health care directive. The advanced health care directive, which you can download, <coughs> um, excuse me, the advanced health care directive <coughs> enables your agent, your health care agent, to make health care decisions for you. Your health care agent can consent to medical treatment or refuse consent to medical treatment on your behalf. Uh, when you're in the twilight, typically it's used in the twilight zone when you've lost capacity. But if you have some illness like cancer or something that's really stressing you out and you can't handle the stress of making medical decisions, you can specify in your advanced health care directive that that's effective right now and your agent can get the consent, can get the information from your doctor and give consent for you. So a durable power of attorney for healthcare is a wonderful device. Now, um, and it's and I want to point out that it's much it's it's um, more important to you than a will because a will operates only after you're dead, whereas uh, these durable powers of attorney operate when you are still alive, and when you're frail and vulnerable and you can't act for yourself. They're, they should be more important to you. Um, next slide. Um, durable powers of attorney can substitute for a conservatorship. Um, um, uh, the, as, as I mentioned earlier, the durable power of attorney for financial matters enables your agent to manage your financial affairs, um, pay your bills, um, et cetera, take care of things. Uh, in, in it, you can nominate a conservator if, should the need arise for a conservator. A conservator, which we'll discuss later, or a conservatorship, a conservator is somebody who the court appoints to run your affairs. Um, and, uh, but often, if you're, if you're cooperative, if you're a demented person who's not too paranoid or whatever, um, a durable power of attorney will be adequate and you won't need a conservatorship. An advanced healthcare directive, as I said, enables your healthcare agent to make medical decisions for you. And you can put in your advanced healthcare directive instructions about what happens to your body after you die. Uh, you can say, I want to be cremated, or and I've made arrangements with this cremation organization, or I want to be buried. I have a burial plot located over here. And your agent will do what you want with your body, and they'll have the authority to do it. You should make certain 
that you give a copy of your advanced health care directive to your doctor and that it's in your, med or if you're, health, you're in a health plan, to the health plan and make sure it's in your medical chart so that when the need arises for your healthcare agent to make medical decisions for you, they can. You can also put into your health, in California, you can also put into your advanced health care directive a, something called a personal care power, uh, which uh, enables your uh, agent to hire caregivers and regulate visitation. So let's say you have some, um, some ill-meaning person who's been importuning upon your demented loved one for money and harassing them and bothering them and riling them up and it, injuring their health, well, you can go to a doctor um, and uh, to, or to, to a doctor or a psychiatrist and get a declaration from the doctor or psychiatrist saying that this is injurious to the loved one, and then you can go to court and get a court order restricting, you know, um, uh, either keeping that person away or restricting visitation, saying visitation should only be monitored, whatever. But this gives your agent the authority to do that. By contrast, a conservatorship, which does all these things, is a formal legal proceeding uh, which is costly and time consuming. You're into thousands of dollars uh, when you do a conservatorship. Now, how sh uh, when should you make your durable power of attorney active? Should you give your agent the authority to act immediately or should you make it so that your agent's authority commences only after you lose capacity when you're in the twilight zone, that period between life and death? when you're not competent. Um, a lot of people will specify in their document that the power becomes effective only when they're in, uh, incompetent. But I don't think that's a good idea. Um, I think you should give your agent the power to act right now. Um, because when you become incompetent and your agent wants to use the power of attorney, uh, your agent will have to prove to the banks or to the um, Merrill Lynch or whatever entity holds your securities that you've become incompetent. And then you're into trouble. Then the agency, the, whatever uh, agency it is, a bank or, or a securities house, is going to is gonna be nervous about honoring the durable power of attorney. Whereas, if, if it's effective right away, they're more, much more likely to be able to, to be willing to honor it. Now, uh, one thing that you can do to help them, to encourage them to honor it, is to get a letter from the doctor saying that uh, your loved one has lost it and send that along with the durable power of attorney to the bank or whatever institution um, showing that you know, your loved one really has lost it and you're in charge, um, even if the power was effective immediately. Another thing that you might want to do, if they're reluctant to honor your authority under the, as you, let's say you're the agent, or another term for it is attorney in fact, if they're reluctant to honor your authority, another thing you can do is use a file that I posted on uh, uh, the same website where this webinar is, um, and it's called, a, um, uh, it's called an affidavit of no revocation. Um, uh, and uh, if you fill out that affidavit and send it to the financial in entity, uh, then uh, they will know that uh, they're held harmless from liability for honoring the durable power of attorney and that if you file a petition to compel them to honor the durable power of attorney in the superior court, they can be held liable for your attorney's fees. Um, how do you use the durable power of attorney? Well, it's pretty simple. Um, uh, the, the person who signed the durable power of attorney is called the principal. So you sign the principal's name, and then beneath that you write, you, you, you write by, and then you sign your name as an agent or attorney in fact. Those are equivalent names. Um, and here's the affidavit of no revocation or death. Uh, how do you sign as a healthcare agent? Um, it's very simple. Mary Gonzalez as healthcare agent for Juan Gonzalez. Very simple. Um, now, um, what do you do if somebody hasn't uh, prepared adequately for themselves? They haven't done durable powers of attorney or trust or other instruments. 
Um, do you, and um, uh, when you're dealing with the problems of caring for that person, uh, do you, let's say your loved one won't take medications that he or she needs. Do you uh, try to persuade them to take the medications or do you give them some fantasy or do you bury it in their mashed potatoes? My recommendation is the following. So long as your loved one is able to understand and appreciate information and to act on it rationally, you want to treat that person like an adult and give that person the respect that you wanted to give them anyway. And so you reason with them. But once your loved one has lost the ability to understand and appreciate information and to act on it rationally, at that point, they need a fantasy. If you continue trying to persuade them to do things or, you know, or, or persuade them that something is the case, you're catering to your own need to have them, to have a respectful relationship with them instead of catering to their need to have a, a fantasy that, fill, that fits within their brain capacity. So then you should, if there are persons that demented, then you want to bury the medicines in their mashed potatoes, uh, tell them it's vitamins. Uh, if they're driving and you can't get them to stop driving, uh, get the doctor to file a form with the DMV that will get their license suspended, hide the car keys uh, if necessary, and if necessary, disable the car. Um, uh, often getting, talking with the doctor and getting medications from the doctor that will attenuate the person's uh, stress level will make them more manageable. Uh, and doctors, uh, particularly doctors who specialize in geriatrics, know how to give just that right delicate dose that makes them a little more manageable without turning them into drooling zombies. But if you can't get cooperation out of your loved one, you're likely to need a conservatorship. Uh, a common scenario and a question that's arisen um, before is, m my mother has a dementia, she's living at home with me, She's becoming aggressive and agitated and needs more and more help, but she won't let me help her. Uh, and I can't take the stress. I have a power of attorney, but it isn't active now, and she's not ready for me to take over. What do I do? Well, one of the things you need to realize immediately is that you shouldn't be handling all of these problems alone. You sh if you're part of a, a dementia clinic, you want to go and see if there's a social worker who can help you problem solve and figure out what to do. Another thing you might want to do is, once again, report all of this to the doctor and see if the doctor has some light dose of medication that will make mother's um, uh, anxiety or paranoia attenuated so that you'll be able, she'll be able to cooperate with you. And you probably you should hire a caregiver. More intractable problems uh, may require a conservatorship. Um, and by, by the way, back on this problem, um, my mother, the power of attorney isn't activated yet, but it sounds like mom really is demented and can't ma manage her affairs and does need the help. So probably a le the doctor's letters or declarations showing that the, she's lost capacity will, are in order in order to activate the durable power. And probably some fantasy that mom can live with. More intractable problems may require a conservatorship. The top problem here is mom lives at home. She refuses to go out of the house, losing weight, memory impaired, won't go to the doctor when I offer to take her, and half the time she won't let me in the door. This is a semi-emergency. This is not a case where you can continue trying to you know, work, and work at it and hope that she'll let you in the door tomorrow. This is a case where you need a conservatorship so you can go change the locks, so you can bring her to the doctor. This is a woman who needs a doctor's attention. You can't let this go on. Next problem is we, younger brother lives at home with mom and he's drug addict and he's been depleting her estate. Mom insists on giving him money. What do I do? You need a conservatorship. As conservator, you can lock up those bank accounts and prevent him from continuing to deplete her estate and prevent her from funding his drug habit. Maybe through a conservatorship, set up a special needs trust uh, for him so that the assets can be used possibly to pay for a detox. 
what are the demented person's rights in all this? Well, the law presumes that everybody's competent. If you're competent to make your own decisions, that's the presumption. So when you have a situation where somebody is demented and they're acting in imprudent ways and you can't get them to cooperate, well, let's start the other way. Let's say, assume they, they are cooperative. You don't have a problem. This issue of their rights only comes up when they're exercising their liberty interests, their freedom to make their own financial decisions, and they're making their decisions imprudently. At that point, they have a, a, a liberty interest in being able to do what they want, and then a right to be protected from harm when they're incompetent. Those are competing rights. So you need to go get a conservatorship at that point uh, to protect them from harm. That's where a court appoints you as their sort of guardian. If, and another case where you'll need a conservatorship typically is if you want to, if it's the right time to place your loved one in a nursing home, doctors tell you that's the right time and you believe it's the right time, then your, if your loved one insists on walking home to Chicago or wherever they, li they used to live many years ago or getting out, uh, you're likely to need a conservatorship. Now, just a few words about a living trust, which is primarily beyond the scope of this program. A living trust is a document you sign that enables your spouse, and if you have one, and successor trustees to manage assets you put into the trust when you become incompetent and after you die. This is really an oversimplification, but that's, that's pretty much what a trust is. And you need a lawyer to do a trust properly, in my opinion. Um, many people think that they can do trusts on their own, download a form or go to one of these web services or, and um, I can just tell you that uh, I've earned many thousands of dollars um, fixing trusts that people did wrong going to court proceedings uh, when they d use these document services. So I, I don't recommend that you do that. It's penny wise and pound foolish. Go see a lawyer. There are plenty of lawyers who are competent at handling these instruments. What does it mean to say that somebody's incompetent? I've been talking a lot about you know, when you're in the twilight zone and when you're incompetent. How do we know when somebody's incompetent? Well, competence is a, is competence in the law is a question of how you make decisions or your ability to make decisions. Uh, there's a test for competence to make a decision, uh, and most decisions, and it's, it's probate code section 812, a section that I had the pleasure of drafting. Um, when we're, we're talking about a decision maybe to make a mortgage, or a decision to give away a car, or give away your house, or pay, uh, or, or hire somebody to put in new plumbing. A person is not competent to make a decision say, to enter into a mortgage, unless the person is able, able to understand, not that they really do necessarily understand, but they're not competent to do it unless they're able to understand and appreciate all of the following information about the decision to uh, and get a mortgage on their home. The rights, duties, and responsibilities created or affected by the mortgage, the decision to enter the mortgage, or affected by that mortgage. The probable consequences, let's say for me, if I'm the person taking out the mortgage, and maybe the consequences for my wife or my kids, for the decision maker and the people affected by the decision, and the significant risks, benefits, and reasonable alternatives involved in the decision. Uh, and let's say my loved one um, hears that the, learns from the care, his or her caregiver that the caregiver's car broke down, and my loved one now says, Gee, well, I'll buy you a car. Th is my loved one able to understand and appreciate the probable consequences, the risk, benefits, reasonable alternatives? Why buy him a car? You could hire a new caregiver for one-tenth the cost, or you can loan them some money. But to buy them a new car, you may not be competent. There's another test in California law, which I had the pleasure of drafting, of um, for how to determine whether somebody's competent. It's sort of a different approach. Before, we were looking at specifically what was their mental state at this particular time, and you, have, you get evidence about whether they were able to understand when that occurred. 
But let's say the person all their life has been able to pay their bills, they've been competent, they've been managing their financial affairs well, they've been prudent, and then comes a period of time and you can discern, you are able to ascertain when it occurred that they started not paying their bills or paying them twice and started giving away money and, in, and investing in flim flam schemes and you can see that this person during that partic particular period of time is substantially unable to manage his or her financial resources or to resist fraud or undue influence. During this period of time you see that they're falling prey to one scheme after another. So when you want to decide whether during that period of time your person was the person competent to take out a mortgage during that period of time or competent to do some new plumbing deal or some new contractor arrangement or make a gift, if they weren't competent, if they weren't substantially able to manage their affairs during that period of time, then there's a presumption that they weren't competent for that particular transaction that you're examining that occurred during that period of time. Now, you're, you should make, draw your own conclusions about whether somebody's competent, but you should always recognize that you don't know everything and you should be getting help from other people to determine whether somebody's competent. And one of the people you want to get help from is a, a doctor or a psychiatrist or a neurologist or a neuropsychologist to get an assessment from one of them. And you want to avoid what I call the Johnny Carson phenomenon where you send your loved one in to get an assessment and your loved one comes in and says, I'm fine, everything's great. I know what my assets are, I know how much they're worth, I know exactly you know, what they are and Sometimes your loved one can know exactly what they are, except they don't exist here on planet Earth. In other words, what I'm saying is that the, your loved one is, the, the technical term is confabulating. They're making up by accident. They're not even aware of it. They're making up false information and giving the doctor a very coherent, cogent explanation, which is illusory. It's wrong. So what you want to do, what, before you send your loved one to the doctor, what you want to do is you want to download a file that I posted on the same website, 10 Signs of Dementia. It's a lot more than 10 signs. And you want to read that file three, four, or five times and get a real handle on all of those signs of dementia. And then since you're using this webinar, you probably have a computer and you probably have a word processor. So you want to sit on your word processor and type out for your doctor all, the, all of the different incidents when you saw your relative or your loved one behave in a way that showed these signs of dementia. And that way when your doctor gets this, your doctor will be able to query your loved one. Your doctor will get this before the examination, will be able to query your loved one about these incidents and then the doctor will be able to do a valuable and effective evaluation instead of getting snookered by this um, uh, Johnny Carson phenomenon. And the doctor will then be able to ask you about these, what the loved one said during the examination after the exam. Who decides that I'm competent for my durable powers and trust? You can leave it up to a doctor or you can have a competence committee. Uh, you can say two doctors can decide when I've lost it or, and I prefer this, in my documents, in my living trust, my wife and I have, well, I have a living trust and durable powers of attorney and in our documents it says that um, my three, my three best friends and my wife, any two of them can decide that I've lost it. And that then putting my wife in charge, and in my family she's already in charge, so we might as well make it legal. But I like that better than leaving, than um, kicking the ball down into the doctor's court and asking the doctor to do it, partly because of the Johnny Carson phenomenon that I talked about earlier where the person comes in and snuckers the doctor, and partly because family members typically know much earlier. Um, Moving right along, uh, what if the demented person did not sign a living trust, durable power of attorney, or advanced health care directive while they were competent? You're likely to need a lawyer to help you get a conservatorship for your loved one. A conservatorship is California's term for what most states call a guardianship for the mentally impaired adult. Your lawyer will find, file a petition for appointment of probate conservator in the Superior Court. And eventually, if everything goes right, a judge will appoint you as your loved one's conservator. 
When you're granted conservatorship over your loved one, you will get uh, letters of conservatorship. That proves you're a conservator. Now, being conservator doesn't mean I'm in charge now and you do what I want. Actually, the, one of the code sections I drafted says that your duty as, as conservator is to do whatever your loved one wants to the extent that it's practical to do so and that you can, um, and consistent with your duty to protect them. Anyway, your letters of conservatorship say that you're conservator. You get act with this, you can go to your loved one's bank accounts and retitle the accounts in your name so that uh, your name as conservator so that you can use those accounts for your loved one's benefit. Uh, you can't make any gifts of your loved one's assets without prior court approval. You can't allow any gifts. At the end of each year, wh uh, while you're conservator, you have to submit an accounting and you have to showing what you've done with your loved one's assets and you have to be accurate or else the court will surcharge you. There are some problems associated with the conservatorship. Family members may file competing petitions uh, to become conservator and costly legal battles can result. Tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars can go down the tube in these battles and they can be lengthy and bitter. As uh, um, almost always the court will appoint an attorney to represent your loved one. And if your loved one wishes to oppose the conservatorship, no matter how crazy your loved one is, no matter how obviously demented, the lawyer is likely to file an objection to the conservatorship and a battle will result. I don't think that that's right. I think a lawyer has a duty to take cognizance of the, um, of the client's incompetence, but anyway, that's the way it usually works and I, you need to know that. Uh, sometimes if there's a big battle about who should be conservator, the court will appoint an independent professional conservator, which can really be wonderful. And sometimes um, uh, the court, will, the court or, or the lawyers will recommend a trust to resolve the dispute. And you'll, you'll probably need, uh, so you may not get what you want. And you probably will need a lawyer to uh, prepare the annual accounting, which will cost a few thousand dollars. On the other hand, these terrible problems that I've associated are most of the time not the case. Most of the time conservatorships go fairly smoothly and they're just wonderful. Remember the mom who, was, who wouldn't open the door um, and let her uh, child in to take care of her? Well, with, and the, the child couldn't get the locksmith to change the locks because the locksmith wouldn't do it because mom ref objects to it. It's her house. But once you have letters of conservatorship, you can go change the locks and put in caregivers. Um, uh, your loved one will be protected against frauds and running up credit card bills. You, can rec you have to record your letters of conservatorship with the county recorder so that mom can't deed away her property anymore. Um, you present the letters of conservatorship to all the banks. They'll retitle them in your name. And you send your letters of conservatorship to all three cre re credit reporting agencies and then if your mom wa tries to open up new, or dad tries to open up new uh, credit card accounts so they can fritter away their money, they won't be able to. Um, there are more benefits associated with the conservatorship. Let's say you have predatory relatives or who are coming in importuning upon dad or mom for money. Well, now you can get a court order shielding, protecting dad or mom from these people or requiring the visitation be supervised or monitored. If there are problems in the parents living trust, you can get court orders amending the trusts. I, uh, con there was a case, conservatorship of Levitt, in which we, um, we had a conservatee who's, we hired a nurse to take care of him, and um, the nurse spirited him away to Las Vegas, uh, married him, and uh, then cut off his Delantin. We thought she was trying to kill him. We obtained a court order excluding her from the residence, and eventually we got the marriage annulled. At, so that's one wonderful thing you can do. Um, you can sue predators who have um, taken advantage of your elder and taken away their finances and you re recover their property back and in a conservatorship you can get double damages and even attorney's fees and costs under the Elder Abuse Act, another statute I drafted. Turning to Medi-Cal planning, let's say you're the spouse and you're worried about being impoverished or you have a disabled child who needs a special needs trust for Medi-Cal under some under a federal law that's based on a California law I, I drafted, you can, um, you can get court orders transferring assets like gifting the home to the healthy spouse 
and, and dividing the remaining assets so that the healthy spouse is not impoverished. Now I've talked a bit about how expensive conservatorships can be, but how can we make them cheaper? And how can we make them more effective and, and um, work faster? Remember that t checklist I gave you, the 10 signs of dementia, the file I set to download? And I said, um, um, prepare a long narrative for the doctor in which you explain all the signs of dementia that you saw for your relative? Well, the same file that you prepare, the same narrative, should be given to the lawyer. And you shouldn't just do it yourself. You should get everybody in the family to do it, and any friends who have seen signs of dementia to prepare these narratives and give them to the lawyer. The more the better, because Lawyer's time costs money. The, the lawyer can read what you wrote a lot faster than he can listen to you uh, ramble on and tell these in, this information. Given the names, addresses, email addresses, and phone numbers of all relevant people, including the doctor, and discuss this narrative with your lawyer. The last issue is how to protect the, the person's independence as long as possible. Um, First, the thing I recommend is to hire a caregiver. While your loved one is still able to understand and appreciate information or follow instructions at least, the caregiver can remind your person what needs to be done and they can do it themselves. But you need relief for yourself. You need to take care of yourself. A lot of caregivers overload themselves, get really stressed out, and then provide care that is beneath the quality of what they want to provide. And I want to point out that the caregiver spouse tends to die first from overload, from stress. We want to prevent that. You're not doing your loved one any favor if you work yourself into the grave. You need to hire a caregiver who can take, provide some companionship to the person, stimulation, guide them, make environmental changes like moving the table or moving things where need to be moved. Um, and helping them with their medications so that you can take care of other things, ordering the meds, making food, or, or doing the laundry, or whatever you have to do. And remember, a good fantasy may be the thing that makes your loved one feel that they're in control of their life. We had a lady who, who was depleting her estate rapidly, giving her money away to her child, who was cr crazy and dissipating it. So we had to get a conservatorship, and what did we do so that she could make her f feel that she was in control? Well, we opened up a bank account in her name and closed it, a checking account, and we got checks now that were drawn on an account that was closed, rubber checks, so that every month when she got her bills, she, she wrote out her checks and felt she was paying her bills, made her feel in control of her life. So that's, and we had another guy who had real estate, we let him make repairs himself with some help but from somebody, so he felt he was still doing the maintenance. You want to make the person feel that they're in control of their lives, and these are some of the ways to do it. Thank you. Ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag UCLA and a pound sign UCLA MD chat. Oh, okay, now here I have some questions. Oh, I should mention that we're, we may do another webinar in which I would talk about living trusts more about how to determine if somebody's incompetent, undue influence, elder abuse, and some, ish, and some discussion of how to get Medi-Cal benefits. Um, next, first question, I'm interested in any advice you have for what can be done when the primary caregiver is a spouse who may be legally competent, but also elderly with health issues, and not able to, adequately, to provide adequate care or willing to accept help. Oh. How can I make sure that the, uh, well, so that's the first question. How do I make, what do you do? This sounds to me like both spouses are demented. Because the primary caregiver is a spouse who may be legally competent, but also elderly with health, health issues and not able to provide adequate care or willing to accept health help. Actually, no, they may still be perfectly competent, but not able to, not willing to accept help. I remember my best friend's dad had this. Uh, I kept telling him, you look terrible. I'm going to end up probating your estate first, and you need to hire a caregiver. I couldn't get him to hire a caregiver. And then he had a stroke. And then his son had to take care of both parents because dad would not hire a caregiver. Um, if you can't, pers you, you have, may have an unsolvable problem. Um, if, if, if the person isn't providing adequate care, 
and you're willing to bite the bullet, which may upset your loved one, you may want to go seek a conservatorship and base it on the fact that they're not providing adequate care and say that the person needs better care. Um, and then you'll end up settling your controversy, settling the litigation by getting, um, having your, the competent spouse hire a caregiver. The next question is, how can I make sure a loved one's advanced health care directive is followed? Um, first, quest, first thing I want to point out is, you don't want to give an advanced health care directive to somebody unless you trust them 120%. Because the durable power of attorney for financial matters is a power to steal everything you own, and a durable power for health care, or an advanced health care directive, excuse me, is the power to cut off your life support um, if you've given that authority, or the power to keep you alive as long as medical science can do it. So it's a those, these are dangerous documents. If, you're, if the durable, if the advanced healthcare directive specifies what's what's supposed to be done, and the healthcare agent is not doing it, and you're a family member, you can file a petition in the probate court to compel your, the healthcare agent to do what should be done, but probably at that point you want to get a conservatorship instead and get a conservator appointed. What if my loved one is at another healthcare facility that does not have their advanced healthcare directive because it's not their main health facility? Well, you can make a copy of the advanced healthcare directive and send it to the facility. It's no problem to make a copy and send it. Um, well, so that concludes the questions. Uh, thank you, and uh, this concludes the webinar.